Tell Me More by Ian Capos. We pulled away from the gloom of the city and into his driveway. Through the fog, his lawn was a well-manicured square of green. An image popped into my head of him plucking weeds from the lawn with delicate mercilessness, trimming an immaculate perforation between grass and concrete. I pegged him as the type that took his work home with him. Not much had been said since he picked me up from the bus station. I figured he was still trying to brainstorm a politically correct way to broach my obvious dope sickness without seeming callous. Even with the heater on full blast and my clothes reeking of old sweat, I could still smell the peppermint on his breath. He was breathing very heavily, though not unevenly. This is it, he announced, tugging the key out of the ignition. He smiled at me sideways, but didn't quite meet my eye. I'd always tried to imagine what his house looked like, and it was pretty much as I had envisioned. Moroccan carpets, stained wood tables and stools, leather, faux, couches and chairs, red lampshades, framed posters of old foreign films, the lingering aroma of incense and steamed vegetables, everything in earth tones and tastefully antiquarian. Tea? he asked me, walking into the kitchen. Sure, I said. I unwrapped my scarf once more and set my backpack down by the door. It wasn't as hot in here as it was in the car, and it was spacious. Doc had done well for himself. I had to assume that this was all his doing, as there had been no other cars in the driveway, and I had never seen a ring on his finger, even years ago when I would visit him once a week. Everything in the house spoke of lonesomeness, or rather hermitage. All seemed to be in its place untouched by foreign hands or childish anarchy. Curious to me, though, was the sight of a vintage dollhouse that sat on the mahogany table, like one you'd see in an old Barbie commercial, sliced in half and two-storied, furnished precisely, as if prepared for a dinner party, almost a mirror image of the house encasing it. I followed Doc into the kitchen. When he said, "'Take a seat, Daniel,' I said, how familiar, and he chuckled, and I took my seat. We sat in silence while the water boiled. When the tea kettle screeched, he turned off the burner and poured two cups. Green or sleepy time, he asked. Green, I said. There was an unmistakable motherly quality about him, a quality that may have had its roots in a good upbringing or, more likely, an earnest, spiteful cultivation. He handed me my cup and sat across from me at the kitchen table. I noted that he had recently plucked his eyebrows. The skin around them was flushed and pink, and the eyebrows themselves were sharp apostrophes. Beneath them, his eyes struggled to meet mine again. So, he said, fidgeting his fingers a bit. He was clearly nervous, which confused me. I had never seen him nervous. I must ask... Why did you call me, Daniel? Well, I said, I finished my sixty days at the rehab. He nodded, already knowing this, waiting for me to go on. And my mom's dead, I said. Oh, dear. He closed his eyes, his brows scrunched down into commas. I'm very sorry for your loss, he said. After a moment, I shrugged, cleared my throat. I brought the cup to my lips, but the water was still too hot. I set it back on the table. How? he asked. Overdose, I replied, and he nodded knowingly. I OD'd about a week after she did, at the reception, in the bathroom. And none of your... There wasn't much family there to begin with. No one wanted to deal with me after that. None of the people that showed, I mean. My mom was enough for them. He looked at me with sympathy. And your sister? I don't know. 
She wasn't at the funeral? He seemed surprised, as if he'd forgotten about my family. Part of me felt offended. He'd been the only person, really, whom I'd ever confided in. Instead of showing my disappointment, I answered, She wasn't at the funeral. Goodness. I sipped the tea and scalded my tongue and my hands began to tingle as the warmth of the house finally settled in. I'm relieved you weren't a casualty, Daniel, he said, finally, his voice barely above a whisper, almost as if he was embarrassed to say so. It was like he was trying very hard to put his words together in a way that wouldn't betray his partiality. Despite his discomfort, he was still trying to play the role of a guidance counselor. You took some accountability, took some positive action. I admire that. I nodded, but was fighting down a hard knot in my throat as he spoke. I really hated talking about this shit I always had. He'd been a good counselor, one of the better ones I'd had, maybe the best for what that was worth. In our sessions, he'd always lay on me some pseudo-Eastern thought shit. Live in the moment, he'd tell me. I'd always had trouble trying to distinguish that from living moment to moment. Can I use your restroom? I asked. Of course, he pointed me down the hall. I walked down the hall, past a wall of watercolors lit by an old lamp, trying to shake my clothes dry of sweat. I opened the door he indicated, closed it, and turned on the light. I opened his medicine cabinet, but there were no pill bottles, no medications. But I saw the jar. Inside the jar stood a very small woman, naked, maybe six inches tall. She looked at me with wide, imploring eyes. Holes had been made in the cork lid. Her hands pressed against the glass. She mouthed words to me, some of which I could probably hazard but chose not to. She was missing hair. Patchy strands of it fell across her bony shoulders. I eyed the tweezers that sat next to the jar. She looked at them too, and then back at me. Before any words could be had, I closed the medicine cabinet and went back to the toilet and took a piss. Afterwards, I washed my hands and then dried them. His hand towels were folded and fluffed pristinely. Avoiding the mirror, I opened the door and turned off the light and walked down the hall. At the end of the hall, Doc stood, his mouth moving wordlessly. I made a bed for you, he managed finally, on the couch. There are some extra pillows and blankets on the floor by the couch, if you need them. Thanks, I said, but I didn't move. I stared at him as he stared back at me. Never before had I seen the yearning in his eyes so undisguised, so front and center. After a moment of holding his wounded gaze, I approached him. He did not move. I stepped closer. I knew he wanted me. He'd always wanted me. His mouth was open. His bottom lip trembled. His eyes were watery. I took another step. I reached out my hand and stroked his cheek. His skin was very soft, I noticed without surprise, like his words. So I gave myself to him as I had so many times before without offering my body. In his bedroom, with the lights off, he entered me. His dick was long and thin. When he penetrated me, it felt like a cattle prod bursting through my asshole, branding me on the inside. Choking gasps came from above me, behind me, in the darkness of the room. He was very quick. It was as if he needed to be quick, to run from his better judgment, to place some distance between the cathartic release of the now and his impending regret and self-loathing of tomorrow. Live in the moment. He came inside me, and the weight of five years of silence fell across my back in a mass of sweat and repressed desire. We lay in a cluster of bedding for a while, but we didn't talk. I knew he was awake because of his short, fast breathing. I wondered what was going through his mind, though I was fairly sure of it. Eventually, his breathing steadied, and he fell asleep, his hand slipping from my forearm. 
Then I was alone in the night time of the bedroom. I lay there for a while longer, smelling the peppermint on his breath. When the birds began to chirp, I got up, carefully unwrapping his arm from my body. He snored and rolled over. I went to the bathroom. She jumped when I opened the medicine cabinet. She began beating at the walls of the jar, shrieking. I'm pretty sure I read the word help on her lips. Hushing her softly, I grabbed the jar and was careful to pluck her out very gently. She talked to me, but her voice was so feeble and so small that I couldn't understand her words. I held her in the palm of my left hand, stroking her mess of hair with the fingers of my right hand. I thought of my mom one day when I came home from school. She was strung out in a bathtub of tepid water. Most of the time she would be rocking back and forth on the toilet seat when I got home, a mess of cotton and dirty gear at her feet, murmuring to me over and over again, I didn't get paid, Danny, don't ask, even after I left the room to poke around for something to eat. But this time was different. This time she looked at me and spread her legs wide, her withered loofah of a vagina lazing beneath the sloshing waters. When I die, she had croaked, bury me in the clothes you find me. I was still too young to know when to not ask why. Because, Danny, she had answered, people don't change. My mother expired in the back of an ambulance just over three months ago, approximately 12 years after her death pledge. I don't know what she had been wearing when she drew her last breath, smelling like anything but peppermint. The little woman was squirming in my hand, beating on my palm. She looked up at me and squeaked words that I could finally make out. Thank you. I'm sorry, I told her, but it's just better this way. For everybody. She looked at me quizzically her face creasing up elastically beneath a sheet of tears, but before she could say anything, I took her head beneath my thumb and forefinger and crushed her skull. Her head burst and she fell limp, blood filling the creases of my palm. After some thought, I threw her in the toilet without flushing. I washed the gore from my hands curiously and then soiled the towels with a half-hearted drying. On my way out, I left the bathroom light on behind me. Doc was still asleep. I waited a while for my eyes to adjust to the darkness of the bedroom, and then I located his pants. I rifled through his wallet and plucked a handful of bills from it. I took his watch, too, a nice Rolex, to be on the safe side. Before I left, I wavered over to him, eyeing his immobile form, which was spliced into lines of gray from the shadow of the blinds. I caressed his wrist, imagining him checking his watch for the time tomorrow and discovering only nakedness. Maybe he'd forget the year. Maybe he'd forget his age. Maybe, hopefully, he'd forget me. I left the blinds as they were, and I didn't shut the door. My heart fluttering in my chest, I slinked down the hallway, grabbed my backpack, and exited through the front door, breathing in the sleepless day. Breathe. Breathe in the moment. Breathe out the moment. Be. Breathe. Be. Don't confront it. Don't run from it. Be it. Breathe. Be. Breathe. Live in the moment. Breathe. The morning was cold and sharp. The sun fought vainly through the clouds, but the houses below it were gray nonetheless, halved between light and dark, dollhouses set up for guests who'd never show. I walked a few miles until I hit downtown, then hailed a cab. I told the cabbie to take me to the nearest pawn shop, and on the drive there, I contemplated my next move. I needed a new scarf, I decided. Kicks were getting harder to come by.
Ian Campos's poetry and short fiction has appeared in numerous print and online periodicals. He serves as co-editor of Milk Fist, plays in the hardcore punk band Cross Class, and Can't Sleep. A lifelong native of Northern California, he is pursuing a B.A. in English at California State University, Sacramento. Visit him at www.iancapos.net. The music in this story is by the artist Sealand. You can find more of his work, including his new album, Dark Days, at sealand.bandcamp.com.